we're very happy to kick off the morning session with a talk on developing resilience, how to be inspired when you're just really tired. Matthew Rasher uh, is the director of training for Homebridge, a nonprofit agency providing IHSS services to over 1,300 clients in San Francisco. And Dennis Galagos is a training specialist at Homebridge. They're going to tell us a little bit more about their program and some of the fantastic things that they're doing. So Matthew and Dennis, please come on up. Good morning, everybody. Um, and if you're visiting, um, welcome to the Bay Area. I hope you're having a wonderful time here in this great city. And it's not raining, um, which it's been doing for a long, long time. Um, as um, they mentioned that um, Dennis and I are from Homebridge, and Homebridge um, is an organization based here in San Francisco. Um, we provide what is called contract mode IHSS services. Um, in California, every county has the option to um, contract with a private agency to provide IHSS services to individuals who, for whatever reason, can't manage their own worker, don't have someone that they want to be their caregiver, um, or have chronic um, substance abuse, mental health issues, also developmental disabilities. Um, one of the cornerstones at Homebridge is that we have always, since the organization began in 1994, um, provided training to our workers. We were committed, the board is committed, that the home care providers should be trained um, and understanding um, the needs of individuals that re require care. Um, in 2010, the city and county of San Francisco awarded Homebridge a contract to expand our training, which Dennis actually developed at the onset, um, to expand that training and offer it to all of the IHSS providers in San Francisco County. Um, there are about 20,000 recipients of IHSS in just the city and county of San Francisco, and there are about 19,000 registered providers. So our trainings are available to all of those providers at no charge. Um, and over the course of a give, any given year, we offer training to about 1,000 people. So we just kind of touch on that surface of that. Um, as I mentioned, Homebridge alone, we serve 1,300 people, 1,200 in San Francisco County, and about 100 in San Mateo County. So those are the only two counties in California that currently have contract mode services. Um, another new business that Homebridge is doing is working with Sutter Health, and we provide transitional care services to individuals who would otherwise present in the emergency room and be admitted when they really could just use some short-term home care, and we contract out on a 24-hour, seven-day seven days a week basis to provide that service to Sutter emergency rooms in the city. So that's kind of a little synopsis of what we do. Um, we, Dennis and I thought, how do we want to start this out? And um, one of the things that Homebridge has been doing is we created a, a video to recruit um, people to be home care providers for us. We employ, we should, I should say, employ about 450 home care providers. We are struggling with a very good economy and a minimum wage that's going up. Um, so we are down about 100 workers. <laughs> so we are aggressively trying to recruit qualified people to do this. So we created a video about a year ago, and we thought we'd start with that. Um, let me, am I doing this right? There we go. Oh, I should say we don't have any disclosures, with the exception of I'm wearing new bifocals because I turned 50 in November, and, and I'm a junior member of AARP. <laughs> so, um, so that's my little snippet for the morning. Anyway, we wanted to start with this video because it's 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 talk. Um, it's some of our staff talking about what motivates them to do this very difficult work um, that they're being asked to do. So we'll start with that this morning. This client has straggly hair, straggly beard, he looks just like the typical mind. Oh, you know, I hate to say it, but that's what he looked like. One of my clients is a former. He walked into the door, before he told the door, he said, I feel the light. Yeah. 
forgetting about that part. <laughs> I'm actually going to turn it over to Dennis. I wanted to make one other comment. One thing that we have done, um, because burnout is what we're going to talk about a little bit next, um, our providers work pretty much by themselves out in the community. Um, last fall, with the um, help of some financial support, we were able to mobilize our workforce with iPhones, and they now have an app that has everything they need regarding their schedules, their client's care plan, and direct communication with their caseworker for that individual while they're out in the field, so there's no delay. It's real-time support to those workers. Um, <laughs> part of the problem is getting some of our older workers to embrace the idea of using a smartphone uh, <laughs> um, and that's been some trickiness but that has really changed um, the way they feel supported and to keep them inspired in what they're doing out there because if you're out there with no support and no one to talk to you can easily become uninspired so I'm going to turn it over to Dennis now for a few minutes good morning everybody nice to see your smiley faces are you happy <laughs> Farrell made you all happy right I mean, that song gets you happy. I, I like that song for that reason. All right, well, um, so we're talking about, there we go. Uh, before we start talking about inspiration, I wanted to talk about burnout. And this is my friend Eric, and he, you can see in his first picture there, he's, uh, he's a little stressed. His hair is uh, sticking up. Uh, he's fortunate, fortunate enough to have hair. And then when we asked him to pose for the picture, he said, hey, I'm just too burnt out. I can't even afford, I can't even do this. And I'm sure some of us have had that experience where we're just at the point where, uh, you know what, I just can't do it. I just can't. Uh, so before I talk about being inspired, I want to talk about burnout. And most of us know what it is. And if you're experiencing burnout, you probably don't need me to tell you what it is. But I'm going to tell you about it anyway. So what is burnout? Well, there was a great paper that I read uh, by Christina uh, Mashlatch, I think that's how I pronounce her name, and Susan E. Jackson. And basically, they defined three very, uh, uh, three central constructs of what is burnout. The first one is emotional exhaustion. You go home at night and you're just, you're just fatigued, you're tired, you just, drop down on the couch, you pop open a cold one, and you just don't care what's on TV. That's, that's how you feel. And I'm sure some of us had that experience. The other one is depersonalization. Negative or very detached feelings. You just, you stop caring. You know, uh, that person becomes just a patient. They're not a person anymore. Uh, we don't care, we really just don't care about the outcome of what we're doing. We're just putting in the time. And then reduced personal accomplishments. Uh, you just can't get any satisfaction. You heard in the video the folks talking about how they like go home at night and they have a smile on their face. They feel good about helping someone. Well, when you're burnt out, you don't get that. It's not there. So uh, the other thing about burnout is you know, some causes of it. And when I did this research for this presentation, I've discovered that many people have many reasons of why they're burnt out. And I'm sure some of you have your own personal reason if you've experienced burnout or are feeling burnt out at this moment. But these 10 ap ap uh, appealed to me. And the first one is losing, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually personalize uh, this for you. Losing sight of one's values and or priorities. So I became a trainer at Homebridge about 11 years ago, and uh, it was because I was really, when I, when I saw the, the job advertisement for a trainer, I was like, this is, this is what I love to do. I want to do this. 
Uh, and over time, I began to lose sight of that's what I really enjoyed doing. Allowing others' uh, expectations to determine how you spend your time. Uh, I got to a point where at Homebridge, I was being asked to do just multiple, multiple trainings, and I just was doing them. I was just like a little robot. I never once said, wait a minute, I can't keep doing this. This isn't helpful to me right now. Allowing issues to become bigger than they really are. So I discovered that I was paying more attention to my students using their cell phones in the classroom than I was trying to teach them the lessons that they needed to be home care workers. Overlooking the importance of the three R's, rest, relaxation, and rejuvenation. Just not doing anything for myself to, re to reinvigorate myself. Not going to the gym, not going for walks, not spending time with my friends, not even sitting down and having a glass of wine at night. Failing to care for yourself. And you know, this is the number one problem with a lot of us who do caregiving, is that we don't take care of ourselves. We can, we're good at taking care of everybody else, but when it comes to taking care of ourselves, we drop the ball. Adding to your to-do list without deleting. Yes, there's always more to do, always more. Taking on more and more and more. Forgetting to express gratitude. You know, just realizing, God, I got a great job. You know, I work in an amazing city. You know, not being able to even think about that type of, think those type of thoughts. Overlooking the importance of humor. Uh, what I noticed was that when I, one of the things, uh, techniques I like to use in teaching is telling jokes. And I noticed suddenly that I would think about, I should tell my students a joke today. Nah, I don't want, I don't, I don't have it. I just don't want to talk about it. So I lost my sense of humor, basically. Getting stuck in a rut, just doing the same work over and over and over again. You're just going in and putting in the time. And then the last one, forgetting to go back to the beginning. And that, I think, is a, an important one, and that's an important cause of burnout. And that is something I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But before I do that, I want to talk about why burnout is such a bad thing for us. Because if one, it's got some pretty negative uh, effects. A Mayo Clinic study in 2012 found that 45.4% of physicians experience some one symptom of burnout. And this one was very startling. Female physicians have twice the suicide rate of females in the general population. Overall job satisfaction for physicians hovers around 50%. One in five nurses plan to leave their current job within the next year, according to one study. And then in the hospitals, where you had higher patient ratios to nurses, basically you had a higher sense of job dissatisfaction and higher patient mortalities. Some other thing about burnout is it's extremely costly, very costly. Uh, you know, we're training people. Everybody has to get trained when they get into the job. And within a year, they're gone. And so a lot of money is spent just rehiring, recruiting, and retraining those individuals only to see that they disappear and are no longer part of your workforce. And then as a, related to home care, 700 uh, representatives from 700 home care companies participated in a 2015 benchmark study, which is published annually by Home Care Plus. And basically what they found was that 61.6% turnover rate. And that was the highest recorded since they began the study in 2010. At Homebridge, this is a real fight that we have, constantly having to recruit home care providers, train them, and then we lose them. And there's a number of factors, but one of the factors is, is caring for people is really hard work. And so the challenge is, how do we stay inspired when often the odds are stacked up against us? So we have to look for inspiration. And where do we find that inspiration? 
For some of us, we might take it from one of these folks. Um, we would consider these maybe spir our spiritual leaders, you know. Uh, and I'm sure you recognize all those lovely faces up there. I don't need to tell you who they are. But for some of us, maybe we don't relate to the spiritual. Instead, we relate to somebody like Stephen Curry or Muhammad Ali, Picasso, Maya Angelou. And, you know, these are the type of people that we can turn to when we're looking for inspiration. And what's really interesting, or we may just turn to someone like our special Olympian. She may inspire us. So it's important to, when we're looking for resilience in our work, where can we find the inspiration? Sometimes it might just be in the person that we're caring for. When I was doing the research, I also asked Google, Google, who inspired Pablo and Picasso? And what he, Google told me was it was his father who inspired him. His father was a, a, a painter and a drawing teacher. Also, he got inspiration from two artists that at the time were relatively unknown. And so he found his inspiration in others. Mother Teresa says she found her, her inspiration in a calling. A call within a call was where she got her inspiration. And then she began her work taking care of the sick and the poor. Muhammad Ali, at the age of 12, had his bicycle stolen from him. And when he was talking to the policeman about it, he said that he wanted to go beat up the thief. And the policeman said to him, well, you need to learn how to box if you want to do that. So Muhammad Ali got his inspiration to box from someone stealing his bicycle. I like to think, what would have happened to Muhammad Ali if nobody would stolen his bicycle? <laughs> and Rosa Parks, she's one of my heroes. Rosa Parks, people have always said, well, the Rosa Parks didn't did refuse to offer her get, get up out of her seat because she was tired from a long day of work. And really what she said is, it, I wasn't tired physically, no. The only tired I was, was tired of giving in. So she found her inspiration within herself. She was just too tired of taking crap from people. So we need our inspiration to keep moving forward, to not be burnt out, right? So where do we, where do we find it? Well, I ask you, think about this. Why did you come to the work? Why are you doing what you're doing? Now, lots of reasons. For some of us, it's to change lives. Often in, in the caregiving field, we, we want to try and change somebody's life. We want to provide hope to someone who maybe is feeling a little hopeless. We definitely want to make a difference. We all hope that our work will make a difference. We want to make the world a better place or improve the life of others. Maybe it's to provide a cure or put a smile on a face. And others, why did you come to this work? Ask yourself that. We want to go back to the beginning, folks. We want to ask ourselves over and over again when we're feeling those feelings of burnout. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? What's my purpose? Because how can we be inspired when we're, when we're tired. That's a tough one. But what I believe, and what I want to teach you today, is that inspiration equals resilience. We become inspired, resilience will develop. And I've, I actually you know, have proven that to myself. That's why I'm sharing this with you. It's the inspiration that ignites what I call the fire of purpose. But we have to go back to what's the reason we came to this work? Because if we forget, we're, maybe what's happening to us when we're experiencing those feelings of burnt out, being tired, is we're forgetting to go back to the beginning. We got inspired to start doing the work that we're doing. Something inspired us to say, hey, I'm going to be a nurse. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a social worker. I'm going to do case management. 
I'm going to do the work that I'm doing with, my, with the people that I care for. This is what we did, and this is what we were doing before the burnout showed up. So where we began is where we're going to find the inspiration. So just, you know, take a few minutes right now to reflect on this. Why did you come to the work? What made you choose it? What were you trying to accomplish? And as you reflect upon that, ask yourself, where does my inspiration come from? What qualities do I have to inspire myself? Yeah. This is where we begin. So I'm going to conclude my talk by just giving you my story and show you how this works. So for the past 11 years, I've been teaching. Uh, I've been a trainer at Homebridge, training home care providers. Many of them come to us who have been family caregivers, and that's it. They don't have a lot of experience. Some of them have no experience. And with the, few, with the exception of a few alterations, I have been teaching the same course three, three, weeks out of the year, three weeks out of the month, 12 months out of the year for 11 years. Needless to say, I experienced burnout. I got to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. But I liked what I did, but I can't do it anymore. But I like what I do, and I can't do it anymore. So I was experiencing burnout. In order to not have to give up what I liked doing, I said, well, what is it that brought me to this work? Why did I, why did I want to do this in the first place? Because at home care, we at home care at, at homebridge we provide home care providers this training because when i started there was no training for these workers and we were asking them to go out and care for some very challenging individuals it's one of the one of the uh, things about homebridge is our clients that we care for are some of the most challenging individuals in the city and county of san francisco and yet we were sending out workers to care for them with very little experience. And the other side of it that really got to me was that we were having these clients being taken care of by people that didn't know what they were doing. And that to me was really frightening. So I said, yes, I want to train them. I have the expertise to do this. I have the passion to do this. I'm going to do this. I like doing this. And I did for quite some time. And I did it very well. And I still do it very well. But that's why I came to the work. I wanted to be able to teach the home care providers how to care for people, how to care for them so they could change their lives, so they could make them happy, so they could put a smile on their face. That's where my inspiration came from. And so, returning to those thoughts and to those feelings, I felt myself resilient, rejuvenated. More, the inspiration came back to me. And I also did some practical things. I went to Matt, who is my, my boss, and I said, hey, I think I'm burnt out. <laughs> And we were able to develop a plan where I was able to reduce my time in the classroom. And I was given the opportunity to start developing and curriculum, rewriting some of our curriculum, and developing curriculum for some of the other programs in Homebridge. And that's another passion of mine, something that inspires me, is writing. So suddenly, I could feel myself rejuvenated, feeling more excited about going to work and not experiencing the burnout. But where it started was going back to where I began. Where did I find my inspiration? So that's my story. I'm going to stick to it. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt and let him finish up. Thank you for listening. OK, thanks, Dennis.
Um, I'll, uh, are we on my slide? Thank you, Dennis. Um, so I thought I'd dovetail that and give a little bit of um, what inspires me. And I was thinking about this as we were talking about this for the past three or four months. I'm like, what what inspires me and in what I'm doing? And and it took I continually went back to when I was graduating from high school in a very small town in Illinois. Um, actually, we lived outside of town in the country, and my dad owned a junkyard. Um, and being a gay man, I had no desire to work on cars or do anything that would get me dirty. Uh, so um, my dad said, well, you need to get a job. So go get a job at the county home, the nursing home, which is about two miles up the road. I'm like, oh, that can't be too hard. Um, so when I got there, um, the, the DON um, said, you're going up on the unit for the retarded people and the mongoloids. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't even know much about what that was. When I got up there, though, um, it was a unit of 20 people and me, and that was it. That was the ratio. Um, but I found two brothers in a room together that were the brothers of our neighbors that I knew for my entire life, um, and I never knew that she had two brothers who had disabilities. Um, and I worked there for four years, and I kept thinking, there's got to be a better way for these people. They can't, there must be a better place for these people to live. They're not sick. Um, so after I graduated from college, I ended up starting to work at a local ARC organization. And one of the things that I did in those four years I was there was Illinois was faced with a lawsuit to get people with disabilities out of nursing homes. And one of my proudest moments was when those two brothers moved into an eight-bedroom home with roommates, and they still live there today, um, and they're not living in a nursing home. And the family brings them home now for Christmas. They don't ignore them. Um, so I've changed some lives there. That always is my inspiration for everything that I've done um, for the next 20 years of my career was dedicated to moving people out of restrictive settings and into a setting that they wanted to live in. And that's what I, I'm always inspired by. Okay? Thank you. Um, so, inspiration. I think um, as I, what I wanted to talk about, I'm like, what do I want to say about how to stay inspired? Well, I guess I want to say don't overthink it. I, if you kind of, I found a, um, some interesting information on a website called lifehack.org, um, and there's basically four points with 12 tips on just easy things that you should do that's always going to help you to stay inspired and be productive. One area is, is um, to stay healthy. Um, these are pretty simple things. Drink a glass of water when you wake up in the morning. I drink a glass of orange juice, but water works too. Um, another, op another suggestion is to move and sweat, exercise. Um, obviously, that's, as Dennis mentioned, that's the hardest one to stick to. Um, I'm notorious for signing up at every gym every year in January, and I quit that gym in like March. Um, but I'm glad that I can support their capital investment by giving, <laughs> giving them lots of money to keep their equipment up to date because I don't use it. Um, getting sleep, uh, making sure that you're rested. Um, last night, it was the hardest time. I, our roommates are getting married this morning, and I will never hear the end of it that I'm not there at their wedding at City Hall. But I had to go to sleep last night while they were all hooting and hollering and getting excited about today. Um, but it always makes you more productive the next day. Um, planning your day. You should try and um, think of three tasks that you want to achieve that day. Um, they can be little ones, they can be big ones, it doesn't matter. But the important thing there is too is to kind of mentally have in your mind that probably those things won't all get achieved if you're like me. <laughs> um, so having a plan on like what are you going to do, what's the backup plan if you don't achieve all those. Um, there's a thing called the 50-10 rule. So you should work on some project, whatever your work is, for about 50 minutes, but then take a 10-minute break from that, whether it's a true break or just to go do something else. Maybe it's check email if you're like us. I have about 20 emails that pop up every hour in my email box. Um, so, but don't do something unhealthy like I used to do and go out and have a cigarette for 10 minutes. <laughs> That's not a healthy option. Um, another thing is to reflect on your day. So at the end of the day, reflecting on what you have um, achieved or 
you, a self-evaluation of yourself. Um, I encourage you just to take time to think. One of the things I do when I get home is I just kind of go into our den and just kind of think about the day. And there's no goal there of like to write down what I achieved, but just process it. If you devote some time to that, it really does work. Another thing is to keep learning. Um, reading, whether that's an actual book or on an iPad or whatever, um, always increasing your knowledge. Um, browsing, staying in touch with tutorials or conducting research, or attending conferences like this. These can be very rejuvenating for you. Um, brainstorm. Think about um, just brainstorming can be a creative goldmine, just to kind of a data dump of stuff that you want to try and do. Okay? Um, and focus on what makes you happy. Um, express gratitude. Um, think about 10 things every morning that you're grateful for. Um, it's easier than you think. Um, I came up with five that just associated with being alive again today, waking up, not dead. <laughs> um, so it's pretty easy to do that part. Um, clean your desk uh, at, your, at your work or at your home in your den. Keep it tidy. Um, if you're obsessive like me, that's an easy one. Um, I always do that. It's kind of right up there with making my bed. Uh, <laughs> and then also indulging in some favorite things, setting time aside to relax and enjoy things that uh, you like to do, whether that's you know playing with your pet or whatever. Um, here in the Bay Area, we're very fortunate. There's lots and lots of parks and things to go on walks. Um, but it's easy to forget to try and do that. Um, for me personally and my, and my partner, we have been um, sucked into the daily drama of what our current president is doing, <laughs> and it's hard. So we have now limited ourselves to one hour of MSNBC a night, <laughs> um, although last night was pushing two just because it was a new chapter in craziness. So <laughs> anyway, so those are just some things that I thought would be helpful to share with you. Um, as we talked about closing today, I was like, we want to close with something that's also inspirational. Um, one, before I came to Homebridge, I had the opportunity to work for an organization called Creativity Explored. It's based here in San Francisco. It is a program for adults with developmental disabilities. It's a visual art studio and gallery. Um, when I came there, I, I had left the world of residential um, back in 2007 and dipped my feet into adult day services, employment training, and landed at Creativity Explorer, not knowing anything about art. Um, but this, tied with my story from back when I graduated from college, um, keeps me inspired. And I go back to Creativity Explorer when they have openings for new exhibitions. But it's, it's truly an inspiring thing to see what these people do. Um, so uh, with the permission of that organization, I'm going to show you a video that they used last year at their fundraising gala. So you can kind of ignore the fact at the end that it says talks about supporting them. Um, <laughs> but I thought the video is a great way to kind of close this morning up, and we hope you enjoy it. Does Kareen think of herself as an artist? Kareen thinks of herself as uh, being the paint. From day one, Roland was hooked. He loves it. And when he can't go to Creativity Explorer, he is not a happy camper. And neither am I. It's special because he gave uh, my brother the opportunity to be uh, something in his life that never before uh, was. We knew early on that she was going to need care 24 hours. So if she's living with us and we're working every day, what's Corrine going to do? We really didn't know what her future was going to be. In my country, it's not opportunity, zero opportunity for people like, like my brother. I'm so fortunate to live in this city that has a lot of resources for people like Roland. Without it, I don't know. 
For anyone who is caregiving for someone with a developmental disability, they want their family member to have a good life. And if you're able to be expressive and be in a positive environment for the majority of your day, that's going to happen. Yeah, Roland doesn't say a lot. It's more the action. It's more like how he does things. He's got these really intensely detailed grid network of lines. What it means exactly, I'm not sure, except that that's how he expresses himself. So Corinne, there's such a passion in this gestural drawings, in this, in this energy that she creates on these pieces that it doesn't matter so much that she doesn't say anything in these words. She speaks in other ways. I feel that socially, she's accepted finally in the environment that creativity gives her. It's almost like a, a miracle, some of the things that their children or their siblings start doing here. So the disability thing really fades to the background and what we try to enhance is what people are able to do, what their abilities are. I was so worried about what kind of life we were gonna have when he was born and now he's a collectible artist. Oh my God, that's fantastic. He gave him a, a little freedom because in his entire life he never earned a kind of money that he earned in, in this program. I don't know if she understands the word pride. I just know that as long as she can be the paint and the brush, she is happy. Does anybody need tissue? <laughs> so again, thank you so much for getting up so early and coming and listening to us. We hope that we have inspired you, uh, that you now have some resilience in your life. Because, you know, I think just seeing the video, you can see this is where, it, this is where it, the inspiration is. But we wanted to close with a quote from the renowned theologian and philosopher Albert Schweitzer. He once said, and he was saying this actually to uh, youth, he said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, the only ones among you who will, really, who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. So thank you for serving.